Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. The topic for tonight, medical negligence. Often when, so when people hear the word negligence, they seldom associate it with the medical profession. An attorney, maybe even an accountant, but it almost sometimes seems like the doctors hold an ethical position within their provision. However, this is a very real and serious issue, something that is concerning South Africans on a daily basis. On a daily basis. Patients all over the world and even in South Africa will often have a claim against a doctor. Sounds strange to some, but to those who have suffered at the hand of a medical malpractice doctor or a person or a doctor rather who has been guilty of medical malpractice or medical negligence, it is not so foreign. Tonight, to help us dissect the somewhat controversial issue of our law, we speak to Dr. George Scharf. Dr. Scharf is not only a doctor and a surgeon, he is also, an he's also a lawyer, rather my apologies. Um, yes, and he serves on both professions as, he, as we speak. Uh, the doctor holds an array of various degrees uh, from MBCHBs to MMEDs, Certificates in Medicine Law, as well as an LLB and is currently completing his LLM. So without further ado, Let's start tonight's show. Doctor, there's a scalpel in my stomach. Medical negligence law in South Africa. Doctor, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, as, as I was saying, uh, a lot of our viewers, some of them have experienced this. Some of them haven't. Fortunately, we hope that the uh, ma majority of them haven't. Uh, but they have. And uh, as we know, tonight, the show is, as always, an interactive show. We take calls and we take tweets. So I am certain that people who have been or have had family members that have suffered uh, certain uh, medical negligence or uh, you know, some sort of malpractice are going to have questions which we hope we'll be able to assist them with. I hope so too. Doctor, if you could start by just telling us a little bit about yourself, uh, how you got into law and how you got into medicine and also what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, generally speaking, uh, the practice of medicine and the practice of law isn't far away. Uh, we assault a patient's privacy, his life, his limbs, his ways of income. So obviously there will be a great overlapping coincidence and working together with law and medicine. It's inseparable in my opinion. But I had an interest in both and obviously as one progresses in your surgical experience you come into contact with uh, various litigation procedures and litigation against doctors. And um, I found it difficult to speak to lawyers sometimes uh, they don't understand the law and uh, therefore I decided uh, to study law myself mm. and um, so far I'm enjoying it uh, being a medical lawyer if I can put it that way or advising on medical law from the medical perspectives and helping uh, legal colleagues uh, uh, justify their litigations or defenses depending mm. on who retains me first Mm. But uh, the problem is that we have to address this problem in South Africa. Mm. It's a big problem mm. and it must be handled correctly. Hopefully I can contribute to that. I have, I have no doubt. I have no doubt, doctor. Uh, so you're a surgeon. You're a gastrointestinal right. surgeon. Uh, but then also, as you mentioned, you consult to law firms and That's also right. to hospitals on uh, the legal issues or the That's legal right. aspects of a potential claim or Correct. an actual claim. Correct. Mm. So just explain, uh, how, how does that work specifically? You would, you would not only consult the patient, uh, the, the client, as a client, mm. uh, but then you'd also examine them as a doctor, right. if they were patients. I'm very adamant that the patient should be examined. I must double check all the medical facts. I've got to make sure that the patient has got her side of the story right. Not so much to win the case, but just to uh, make sure that the lawyer doesn't embark on unnecessary or frivolous litigation, which is a big problem for lawyers if they uh, embark on such an adventure and then end up losing the case. Yeah. It's uh, no joy for anybody at the end of the day. We must also prevent unrealistic expectations and false hopes and um, unreasonable expectations sometimes. And uh, just remind a patient that uh, she or he hasn't got the facts right and uh, we have to help the people along that line as well. Mm. So it's an important role. Of course, uh, being specialist knowledge, being, being involved, 
the court would also always want a medical expert witness to help them decide the case. Of course. Yes. And that is where I hopefully can play a big role. So uh, let's look now at, at what exactly is medical negligence. The words medical malpractice and the words medical neglig negligence are two words that, that I know from, from very, very uh, little exposure to this uh, as an attorney. Is there a difference between the two? Uh, and if there is, how are they applied differently in the law? Basically, there is a difference. Uh, the overlapping uh, concept is, of course, medical malpractice. But we don't like that term. In South Africa, uh, following the book of uh, Professor Carstens, who is doing medical law at the University of Pretoria, we prefer the term professional medical negligence. It's a softer term. It's a more reasonable term. Malpractice has a, a meaning of a willful and, uh, act <coughs> of uh, negligence, which I don't think I've ever come across a doctor willfully uh, harming a patient. There's always... Uh, an uh, element of uh, unfair and unjustifiable accusation of, uh, of uh, gross mal uh, malpractice. Mm. And that is why we don't like that term, actually, unless, it's, of course, it's a criminal deed, which is completely the other kettle of fish. So malpractice goes around, has a patient been harmed by a negligent act of a medical practitioner? And so a criminal deed, just to stop you there, and uh, something that we might want to touch on a bit later, something, for example, like euthanasia. Euthanasia, it, it's a very big topic in itself, uh, but uh, our law at this stage still specifies uh, that euthanasia is not allowed, and That's with primitive. our constitution, as far as um, the right to life is concerned, we have got no right to take somebody's life. Because we cannot consent to, 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 right. to our own death. Anyway, carry on. I don't want to disturb you. Carry on with the... Uh, we're talking so about the um, we must set out the framework and the basis of litigation. And uh, in South Africa, we have the law of delict. Um, in England, it's called the law of tort. But... Um, it basically boils down to that uh, we want to see that an uh, act had been done, that it was negligent, either by commission or omission, it's usually by omission, uh, in other words, not doing the right thing mm. or the correct thing. And so to break that down for our viewers, uh, obviously, as you understand, our viewers are lay people, yeah. uh, a lot of them neither doctors nor lawyers. Yeah. So, so when you talk about negligence, uh, the act or a commission or omission, so that's yeah. the, uh, either performing some, uh, doing something or mm. the failure to do something. To do something. That right. is the most common cause in medicine, by yeah. the way. What, the failure, the omission? The omission. Okay. And then um, did the patient indeed uh, suffer harm from mm. it? And um, is there any blame? Because sometimes we do things that we are not to be out uh, at fault for. I mean, it could be an emergency um, of whatever, but uh, sometimes it's not a doctor's fault that there is a act of negligence and that must be sorted out. And then there must be a negligence, uh, um, between the negligence and the harm done, uh, uh, causality must be established and there must be indeed a nexus or a binding between... A legal chain. A legal, a legal chain yeah. of events between did that harm really come uh, from the negligent act? Because maybe it is still from complications forth flowing out of the original disease. Mm or facts beyond any person's control, like a patient getting a heart attack, which is nobody's fault. You can get a heart attack at any place at any time. It Absolutely. just happens after an Absolutely. operation, perhaps. Yeah. You see, and, and, and this, is, this, is where, this is where it becomes, uh, I, I think, somewhat confusing uh, for, for patients Correct. or for clients, yeah. uh, so to speak. Because the basis, the fundamental basis of a claim against a medical professional is what the, the, the judges or the courts or the, the lawyers would look at, the reasonable person test. Correct. Right. So reasonable foreseeability, reasonable uh, uh, action, reasonable omission. So he may reasonably not have done or he may reasonably would have done specifically. Correct. So is that right, the reasonable person test? It's a reasonable person test and it must be... Um, uh, 
as objective as possible, but basically it is unfortunately really a subjective test. There will always be some form of bias. Absolutely. There will always be uh, a human element involved. And our own personal experiences, I mean, we've all been in a corner, a tight corner, where in retrospect we felt, oh boy, we perhaps didn't treat this patient as good as we should have or could have. But then um, you've got to consider all the uh, contributing uh, factors as well, patient factors, uh, environmental factors, uh, the hospital where you're working, uh, did the defibrillator, for instance, really work? Mm. Uh, was a sister qualified to assist you in a difficult operation? Um, uh, was it perhaps a power failure like we had the other day? Uh, and this type of stuff, um, all can contribute to the whole picture of this incident. Mm. And um, one has to dissect it up exactly what happened. It's just like a well-known advocate once said, um, nothing happens suddenly. It's all a chain of events and all a chain of following on and uh, things that are missed, uh, mm. just like uh, seldom if ever a ship sinks just suddenly or a plane crashes just suddenly. It's a group of uh, continuous effects that uh, work out to cause an ultimate summation of this uh, catastrophe that can happen. And we doctors have to see now where is the various doctors at fault, if there are any fault. Mm -hmm. And what are the patient's factors <coughs> that are at fault. Mm -hmm. And we've got to weigh it up and say eventually, yes ma'am, I think you have a case, or no ma'am, I don't think you have a case. And you've got to convince the lawyers to, that there's a case or not a case. Doctor, the issue, or at least the regulatory uh, body, should I say, uh, uh, who, who, the, the, the organization that regulates uh, negligence or any claims in respect of medical uh, malpractice, etc., against doctors or medical professionals, um, that is the HPCSA, is that correct? Uh, partially correct. It's more a disciplinary council when it investigates uh, claims against doctors. It's perhaps interesting to look at the statistics. Um, Sorry, the disciplinary council, is that the med medical and dental? Dental council. Right. That's more disciplinary council. against the action in, uh, of the doctor. The doctor is then liable and answerable to the Health Professional Council of South Africa, which is a statutory body uh, established there by the National Health Act. Right. And uh, it's, it's completely uh, mandated by law mm. and under the protection of the Minister of Health. But uh, they investigate ethical complaints more against the doctor. Mm. Was the doctor rude or did the doctor overcharge or did the doctor really make a severe uh, misdiagnosis which caused the patient harm? Mm. Whereas you get the civil cases against the doctors where patients actually to use a good American term, sues a doctor for she feels that she had been harmed uh, by this doctor. And uh, that's completely uh, other kettle of fish. It's not really unethical behavior, although there's always perhaps an element involved in the guilty parties. Uh, it's perhaps just interesting to mention the statistics involved. Uh, when one looks at the uh, Health Professional Council of South Africa, and I stand to be corrected, there might be a member of the council listening, and he can phone in quickly and correct me. But a large percentage, perhaps 70 to 90 percent of all cases against doctors that have been reported at the Health Professional Council of South Africa actually don't materialize because there's no real case. Mm. And a guilty finding is only about found in 10% of cases. So I mean, I, I, think, I suppose that's a, a, that's a good thing. fall by the wayside. And in civil cases, at least 60 to 66% don't make any compensation or uh, payout or settling of claims uh, for the plaintiff against the doctor. Well, let's look at that reporting uh, issue, reporting of cases. Uh, doctor, I, I was, we were talking earlier uh, when we were having a chat that in my experience, or at least uh, certainly as an, as an attorney or even uh, as a layperson, it doesn't appear that people are very quick 
to, to go and report a doctor for medical negligence or at least uh, are not aware that a specific act could even amount to medical negligence and that they might even have a claim. So this is really where we intertwine the, the, the stethoscope and the, and the judge's hammer, so to speak, because yes. this is really where they combine and where, where they collide. And uh, is, it, is it a situation in South African law or it's a South African medical uh, fraternity that there's this kind of wall that is put up against claims or does the medical profession see their fair share of, 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 of uh, uh, civil claims? Well, obviously, uh, we doctors uh, all know the, that uh, there is litigation against any of us at any time. Uh, we joke and say we've always got a court case hanging somewhere in our closet. Mm. So um, I, as a doctor, feel, and if you look at the medical articles, uh, they speak of a so-called deluge of uh, medical claims. And okay. if you listen to the medical insurance companies, They've got their hands in the air about how many claims they have to settle. And at every Congress, these people speak to us and tell us they can hardly afford it anymore. Mm. We know that in Australia it had been so bad that in 2002, the whole insurance, medical insurance companies just folded. Mm. And for two or three years, Australians actually practiced without any medical insurance. And... Uh, Coincidentally, the claims dropped significantly in that uh, period. Yes. But it is very difficult. I mean, uh, if a patient does have a, a good claim against a doctor, she should continue. And that's the only way she's going to get rest for herself and closure on the issue. And uh, doctors shouldn't be too sensitive, perhaps, although we are sensitive people. That is why we become doctors in the first place. Yeah. And the second is, uh, I don't know of any doctor ever in 40 years I've been in medical practice and as a medical student that deliberately went out of his way to harm a patient. Mm. So there are surrounding conditions and environmental conditions. You are overworked, you're in the casualty department, you are tired, you are irritated, you will make a misdiagnosis under those circumstances. Mm -hmm. Some patients can be uh, um, quite uh, a handful to handle. They are not understanding. They perhaps have a psychological complication as well. And it's difficult for our doctors to have a good and proper report with the patients. So yes, that creates a scenario where some patient is going to be most unsatisfied with this doctor or this doctor's treatment. Mm -hmm. And we do have hostile patients as well. We had one the other day that was really throwing a tantrum, if I can say so, in the consulting rooms in front of other patients, quite uninvited and unexpected. Mm -hmm. And we have to eat that up. Yeah, and we've got to Doctor, we're going to be taking a very quick commercial break, but right. when we come back, I'd like you to take us through this uh, claim process and how okay. do people go about it. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for staying tuned. We'll see you very shortly. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. To help us do this tonight, and in fact to show us that uh, there's a very fine line between uh, legal ease and medical, uh, medical profession, we are sitting with Dr. Scharf. Dr. George Scharf is a surgeon as well as a lawyer, and he's assisting us, as I mentioned, to dissect this somewhat controversial aspect of our law. Doctor, what the the viewers are looking at is a, a bit of a, hu a bit of humor. It's a cartoon essentially where surgeons are sitting around a table, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, they're talking about. Uh, uh, this lawyer is trying to sue the one surgeon and the other surgeon says, uh, you know, you really must concentrate. You've just put this man's brain into his foot. <laughs> so, yes, okay. it's, it's, it's a bit of humor. The topic, as we mentioned for tonight's show, is Dr. There is a scalpel in my stomach. Fortunately, there isn't one in my stomach, but uh, this is not something completely and, alt and, and utterly foreign. Am I right? I mean, are these some of the types of cases that you, that you, that you see in this, uh, in this, uh, this aspect is, of our law? This is quite right, but there are other more complicated cases. These cases are quite self-evident. Uh, we have a rule, a rule of thumb, but it has been uh, explained in Canadian law initially in the 1920s 
that uh, whoever puts an instrument in a patient or a swab for that matter, an operating towel in a layperson's term, he's got the responsibility to take it out. Um, but sometimes in uh, circumstances can be overwhelming, like a, a sudden emergency, unexpected emergency, like an artery rupturing or uh, continuous bleeding so much so that we have to put operating towels, for instance, in the pelvis area to stop the bleeding just to get this person alive yeah. and perhaps bring him back to the theater a day or two later. Lay people don't understand that often. And But you rely in South Africa on the theater sister who has to keep her mind, but she's got an assistant on the floor as well to count the swaps and to count and check the instruments. And at the end of an operation, when you are busy closing the patient or ending the operation, you will actually have time out and ask your sister, sister, instruments and swaps, suture needles, are they correct? And she's got to confirm swaps and instruments and needles are accounted for. And then you start closing up. And usually at that time, just to make double sure, the counting procedure takes place again. Okay. Um, but I can imagine that uh, counting can go wrong. It's human to err for yes. all of us. And then a swab is left in place. It even happened to me. I think the uh, surgeon that it hadn't happened to yet must still be born. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, my sister just gave me a deadly quiet look and clenched the teeth and said, Doctor, there is a swab in this patient. And I said, it's impossible. <laughs> okay. And she insisted. And I said, OK, you win. I'll open up. And I was quite red faced when I took the swab out. And she was right all the time. Mm -hmm. What happened was that my assistant actually put the swab in in a moment of panic and never told me that there was a swab so in. So you could and never have even seen it. This is how accidents happen. Mm -hmm. So you've got to stick to your drill. And I, um, I'm very uh, adamant that it uh, happens. At the moment we've got a case, it's Sapuna, so no names mentioned, where a swab was left in the abdomen. And, uh, but this was an emergency condition. There was unexpected bleeding. And uh, I'm trying to convince the lawyer that this doctor was not un uh, under these circumstances uh, negligent. Mm. And at the end of the day, the patient did not suffer that much harm of the swab being left back. So maybe she should just uh, kindly accept it as an incident, but that caused an a no long-term harm. I'm going to ask you about harm uh, coming back now. I'd like to remind you that this is obviously an interactive show. The phone lines are now open. The number to dial is 11 zero eight six seven seven zero one or two or three. Of course, it appears on your screen as always. And if you have had a similar type of issue or a similar type of incident happen to you or someone you know and you'd like to ask the good doctor questions about it, please feel free to call in and also to tweet at Legal Ease on ITV. We're waiting for, waiting for your questions and we'll be able to assist you once they arrive. Dr. Harm, is that the ultimate deciding factor in, in a claim or is it a very important factor when looking at a claim? I would say it's a very important factor, harm or injury. Right. Because if you have suffered no harm or injury, we feel you've got no claim. What about the prospect of harm or injury? Um, is there a situation, is there, is there uh, what, what, what we refer to in our law as pain and suffering or emotional uh, Yes, damage? of course, there are general damages that right. can be claimed separately from the real uh, damages uh, like medical costs and future medical costs. So we do have the general damages claim of pain and suffering uh, and uh, um, loss of amenities and uh, loss of life expectancy. All those things can be claimed for under general damages, definitely, yes. Yeah. So, so I mean, uh, uh, something as simple as, uh, you know, there's the, the something in my stomach, it might, it might not be so detrimental to my health, you've got, to, oh, you've got to take it out again, I'm now feeling quite stressed and strained about it, is that a... Is that a, a Absolutely, you're going to uh, undergo a risk of another operation, mm -hmm. and just like aircraft can crash and cars can have car accidents... Please don't say people <laughs> can crash on the operating table. <laughs> and then, yes, it yeah. can happen. Uh, I mean, uh, generally speaking, one in a thousand to one in ten thousand people can die under an anesthetic. We've got to accept that as a reality. One in how many? 
depending on the patient's health, one in a thousand to one in ten thousand could possibly die under an anesthetic. Healthy people, you can have an allergic. That's, that's quite you can have an allergic reaction to the muscle relaxant, for instance. Um, so that's a very sad if it happens, but. Well, we have a call online. I hope that he hasn't uh, uh, suffered a specific incident okay. or she, but let's take a look in here. Uh, let's take a listen. Salaamu Alaikum. Good evening, caller. We are waiting for your question. Hi, good evening. My name is Emran. Um, I just want to find out, my wife went in for an op. Uh, it was actually childbirth. And um, what happened is the, the, uh, the doctor actually decided to do a cesarean because there was a delay in birth. And my wife then came out with an abdom total abdominal hysterectomy. She was actually busy, and the doctor was actually monitoring this for the entire term, the whole four weeks. But then um, the doctor actually, there was a rupture in the, in the, in the, in the oh, and the doctor tried to stitch it, but he didn't stitch it too well, so it started bleeding, and then they released her, um, like a day after, after putting like, Four pints of blood. Then she started bleeding heavily, and then they returned her back. But then they had to do a surgical hysterectomy, and she stayed in theatre forever. And, you know all that stress. Now we can't have any more kids. Uh, thank you, Kola. Um, I don't know if you heard the full question. Uh, I did you get enough to gathered answer? enough. Right. Um, it was a uterus rupture following a cesarean section, or in the area of that. Correct, yeah. That's, of course, a devastating complication for any gynecologist to address. Before I specialized in surgery, we had a couple of cases like that. It's uh, life-threatening. The uh, uterus, the pregnant uterus, is uh, one of the organs that has the most blood per gram weight. It's incredible, the blood supply. Sure. And uh, these patients can have exsanguinating bleeding within seconds, if not minutes. But um, that is a correct procedure. If there is a rupture and the patient keeps on hemorrhaging, it's if I understand the question correctly. Though I'm not a specialist gynecologist, I've got enough contact with uh, gynecologists to say uh, a hysterectomy has to be done. Uh, who caused the rupture? Uh, it's difficult to think that it's a doctor's fault. So in this case, uh, this is an adverse event at the most, meaning it was basically an unforeseen and an unpredictable and an unpreventable incident, which is surely no doctor's fault as such. Uh, sending her home a day after she received four units of blood, that's a bit risky. But um, unfortunately, uh, there are many factors that makes the doctor decide when to send a patient home. But four units of blood is quite a large blood transfusion. And personally, I think most reasonable doctors, if I can put it that, would rather keep the patient still under observation for a day or two in case there are complications of a blood transfusion. You know, that could, could, could lead us into that <clears throat> other topic that we were, the discussion that we were having, uh, doctor, where, where you know, it's a, it could be a situation uh, where it then again boils down to a monetary complication mm -hmm. uh, you know it, it could be a situation where the, the medical aid could have expired or uh, right. maybe perhaps doesn't cover two days uh, uh, of recovery we, we time. see those problems yes you know, but but then isn't there then a fine line between the ethics of a doctor in accordance with his hippocratic oath um, and you know what his obligation is to the medical aid companies or to the hospital or to whatever institution he serves Ethics comes first at all instances. One can fight and argue about who pays what and what the money is and what the fees are at the, at the later stage. But when a patient is ill, your concern is, regardless of what lawyers say, regardless of what hospital administrators say, you, you consider the benefit of the patient. Mm -hmm. You will not discharge a patient or subject him to no or her to no treatment just because there are money matters. Mm -hmm. um, that must be borne in mind. And coming back to emergencies, uh, in uh, our own excellent constitution, the Constitution of South Africa that was formulated and legalized in 1996, uh, there's a clause uh, in the Bill of Rights, section 27, paragraph 3, that clearly states that 
um, you cannot refuse, if you have the capability and the facilities, a patient that is an emergency. You've got to treat him. The bill gets paid later. Your ethics are, right your morality now, right are, there. you're doing the correct thing now. That actually answers a question that uh, we've received on Twitter, which says, when can I be sent to another hospital, uh, and, and if so, uh, oh, can I be sent to an hospital, and if so, when? So, you know, you've pretty much just answered the yeah. question. I think there's an obligation on the doctor to, to, to treat that patient, to stabilize him first yeah. and foremost. And, and then if he's stable, and he's not in immediate life-threatening, mm. say the distance to the next hospital is half an hour, then it's perhaps reasonable to send the but patient But then again, if it hospital. is, if there is a life threatening, because this is a personal experience that I had, yeah. obviously not with me, fortunately, but with a, a very close family member, where then, after having stabilized her, she was still in a critical condition, although mm. stable, and I think that they use that term, uh, stable but critical. Is that, is yeah, that correct? It's an allowable term. S yes, so the st in a stable condition, so maybe perhaps having satisfied his obligation in accordance with that uh, um, part of, of the law or the medical profession, either way, if you look at it, then sent her off 30 minutes away to another hospital. And when she arrived there, the, the, the receiving doctor then said, my goodness, this woman is not going to make it. Um, you know, it, it, so I think there is, uh, you know, there, there really needs to be, and in a situation like that, I think if the woman had lost her life, uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, she would, the family would have had a substantial claim against the doctor. Yes and no. <laughs> If uh, death was inevitable in any case, uh, say in the progression of the original disease, then I think it will be hard to uh, put a claim against the original referring doctors. Um, but you discuss this with the family. I would like to discuss it with the family. It's not always practical to discuss it with the family. Of course. Uh, but uh, once, uh, for instance, a, a, a private patient who hasn't got a medical aid is admitted, to say intensive care in private practice, we're speaking of four, six, ten thousand rand a day. Yeah. That's a lot of money, and if people have to foot the bill, the bill must be paid. Uh, private hospitals arguably do make a good profit, but uh, at the end of the day, salaries have to be paid, overtime has to be paid, medicine has to be paid. It's very expensive, unfortunately for us. And perhaps it's the present economic circumstances. Mm -hmm. Days gone past, it wasn't that expensive. But now with the Rand dollar exchange rate, uh, medicine has just skyrocketed past all realistic boundaries of what inflation is advertised in the newspapers or by the politicians. But th th this is substantially different. Uh, th this, this, this. Uh, should I say this environment, so to speak, of this med of of medicine or the practice of medicine in South Africa is substantially different to other parts of the world. I mean, you've got uh, uh, um, uh, in the UK you've got uh, free healthcare. In the US you've got free healthcare. Australia, Ireland, etc. Uh, all these, these these other countries you've got this free healthcare and and uh, doctors at sort of at your level are treating people for free because the the government system is so uh, apt. Is that correct? To a certain extent, yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had it in the past. Uh, my mother, for instance, had a good medical aid, but she was just too happy to go to the academic hospital, and she felt as a pensioner that she was getting good service there. Yes. She would pay a certain fee, uh, uh, albeit not as much as private patients pay, but because she had the means, she would pay a fair fee. Uh, but... Uh, Nowadays, uh, somehow, our standard of care, or it seems to be perceived by all of us, mm. have gone down in the state hospitals and some academic hospitals, and um, that's a cause of concern. There should be a very viable, worry-free option to take your family member to a private hospital if he's got a medical mm. aid, or to a state hospital if he hasn't got one yes. without biting your fingernails yes, and fear that now you've uh, perhaps gone into a terrible situation where your family member is going to die just because the facilities are not up to standard. We remind our viewers that we would like to hear uh, you share your views and comments and questions on this topic. <coughs> Please call us uh, on 11 or 2 or 3, the number on your screen. We're talking medical negligence law in South Africa. Doctor, so <coughs> going back to 
the issue of uh, uh, the doctor being uh, negligent or potentially ne potentially negligent in a situation or having, having sent the, do uh, the patient away somewhere else. These are theory called the but-for theory, am I right? Uh, That's in right. Law. So, so just explain that for our viewers. When we ask whether a, pa a doctor at least had a negligent act uh, or done by him yes. and a complication, and the effects of that, we would usually have the test, the but for test, had it not been for this incident mm -hmm. or this act, but for the act or omission, the yes. act or of omission, this would not have happened or this would have happened, and that eases it our reasoning to say that this is mm -hmm. a, a cause and a reason for possible negligence claims. However, you've got to get your facts right, and many patients do not get their facts right. Mm -hmm. Many lawyers don't know what is fact and what is perhaps exaggeration. Thus, uh, this is difficult sometimes to get the but for with the proper facts mm -hmm. um, associated with possible litigation. And um, patients should bear that in mind. The facts must be correct. Mm -hmm. If the facts are false or fabricated, or exaggerate it, your claims are going to not make it. A lot of law firms who specialize in medical negligence or medical malpractice law, a lot of them work on what is called the contingency Correct. fee structure. Yeah. Now, contingency fee for purposes of our viewers is no win, no pay. Uh, we, we will litigate on risk, essentially. That's what it is. Yes. Uh, just explain that to us. Why, why is that usually the case? Well, it's big risk, and um, it's a lawyer's choice. Um, we doctors don't like it because it is, or it seems to be encouraging uh, uh, medical litigation against us. Uh, we doctors are in a, in, in, um, well, we're in a difficult position uh, because uh, we have to pay out of our insurance the moment we get a lawyer's letter to have our lawyers look at this Mm. A claimant and uh, guide us into our um, response and that costs money already that costs a lot of money and thus uh, we are not uh, paying if the case or we are paying regardless of the case mm. is won or lost so uh, we doctors are a bit unhappy with the contingency fees when it comes to medical expert witnessing, it is internationally accepted that doctors shall not become medical expert witnesses on contingency fees. Right. The reason is as soon as I, as a doctor, say I will take contingency fees for my medical expertise, I will become biased. I would want to win this case at all costs. Otherwise, I don't get paid. Mm. And I also need to make a living. I've also got overheads. So it might cloud my judgment. Mm. So we've got a fee system and we negotiate the fee system with a lawyer. Mm. He can negotiate it with his client mm. and we settle for that. Uh, this is what the service I do and this is what my fee is. But since we're talking about human life, uh, the, 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 the prize money at the end can be substantial. I mean, quite uh, right. the claim quite can right. be quite, quite large. We'll be taking a very short commercial break again. And when we come back, we remind you the phone lines are still open. Please call us with your comments and share your questions. Alternative, tweet us at LegalEase on ITV. We are talking to Dr. George Scharf. The topic for tonight, Doctor, there's a scalpel in my stomach, medical negligence law in South Africa. Salam alaikum, we'll see you shortly. Salam alaikum, thank you for staying with us on Legal Ease. If you're looking at the image in the back of the screen right now, I hope that isn't you, Doctor. They're looking at a picture, as I mentioned to you, these are scissors in this gentleman's abdomen, or this person's abdomen, I don't know if it's a gentleman or a lady. Um, and and this, is, this is pretty much what we're talking about. These are called online. Let's take a call quickly, and then we'll come back to this okay. image and certain other problems that we can face in medical negligence. Mm -hmm. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, caller. Go ahead. Hi, good evening. Sorry, it's me that called in earlier. Yes, sir. Um, I just want to find out if you've gladly worked. Um, um, in in my instance, obviously it was a it was a government hospital, right? But it was the the assistant doctor that informed me that they 
from the, the, the gynecologist um, who was a consultant, you know, um, he must take better care of the of the rapture. And second to that, there was um, the second time when my wife now was very critical and she lost all blood and repeating to give us six pints of six pints. Um, the the anesthetic told me that they struggled a lot. They did restart. They struggled a lot with the bleeding. And she told me that you know the doctor made a mess. But the question is, I don't have this in any written format or anything. Is there any rule or any law that will cause doctors to tell the truth and not to pass the message to each other? Mm. And when does this prescribe? So I wrote the letter mm. to the hospital and I told the CEO, please investigate the claims and come back to me, mm. which I have in writing numerous times and the truth. Did not come back to me as written to the minister. Nobody's come back to me. Yes. Okay, brilliant caller. Thank you very much. Doctor, two issues which came out of that, really speaking, which are very helpful for, for, for the topic for tonight. One, being prescription of a claim, uh, and two, being uh, uh, what we talked about uh, in our informal discussion earlier, which is doctors will pretty much stand together. Uh, just take us through those two quick things. Yes, I, I, I must remind that in the eyes of the law, what a doctor says about the other doctor is hearsay. It doesn't count that much. But um, I think just to answer the gentleman's last question, he must make an appointment with the CEO of the hospital and go and see him personally and then insist to have a fair hearing and saying and an explanation of what happened and why it happened and what was done. Because uh, it's a stressful situation and perhaps Things were said that wasn't meant in detail. Uh, at least his li wife is alive, as I can gather, and um, thankfully, yes. uh, things like that do happen. It happens to all people, and unfortunately, pregnancy is not without risk. Yes. But uh, coming back to the question of um, prescription, a prescription is that uh, usually it lasts three years. So normal. Uh, yes, and um, you would usually get the lawyer's letters a day before it expires or 10 days before it expires that you've already got time to give you a reply. But Sorry, but just stop you. It can be longer. Is it, is it the same cases. principles where a summons is the only thing that interrupts prescription? That's right. Right, okay. So, Doctor, so going back then to, to the gentleman's uh, problem and the gentleman's question, he, he, if he now exhausts all the avenues, going to the CEO, writing letters, not receiving any responses, does he does he then prime himself for a particular for a, a that's claim? That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. Uh, we are trained, for instance, by the various uh, medical insurance companies, and also if you do read the books, good communication is the best preventer mm -hmm. of uh, medical litigation against doctors. Uh, unfortunately, communication comes from both sides, yes. uh, from one person and the other person, and you've got to reach the same level. It then starts usually with uh, an apology. Uh, of course, I as a doctor, I'm upset if a patient is dissatisfied no with me. No matter what, yes. And I will apologize for the inconvenience. Uh, I mean, that's not what I wished upon them. But then we've got to assess the story, and we've got to systematically go through this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And once we are on a good level of uh, communication, I can tell the patient, look, these are the facts and this is what happened, and I will apologize once more. Mm. Uh, but I am sorry is not an admission of guilt. Uh, that's right. That is the point. Um, just because a doctor has said or given an apology, uh, it is uh, not an admission of guilt, and uh, you should not go up that avenue unless you have other substantive... Uh, factors that can enforce a claim. But uh, don't say the doctor apologized, thus he is guilty. Yeah. It uh, won't work that way. But um, often we find that uh, once you had spoken to the family, you, um, you allay the situation where you can expect uh, litigation, the patients accept it. Unfortunately, there are hostile patients. There are patients that become terribly self-centered. Mm. Uh, they go through a, a self-centered phase that can even be psychologically like autism where only he counts. Only the patient who feels he has been 
done in by the doctor accounts mm. and you can't stop those people from litigating against you mm. but at least um, as part that of tends, your yeah. uh, defense you can say look i've done Try everything to, to, the damages, uh, absolutely. to help this patient but they they are on the wall path they want some form of compensation and just just i just kind of reminded myself about something mitigation of damages so you you realize during an operation you've made a mistake you now rectify it you do rectify the mistake and then you you kind of uh, you know do whatever procedure required to make sure that you know no further damage has occurred from That's that mistake. Right. Does that put you in good standing in a, in a, Absolutely. against civil Absolutely, and uh, speaking uh, from that too, uh, the patient factors also count. Uh, remember, we go into patient negligence as well. Uh, when we defend doctors, we will definitely go into uh, what the patient did and what he should have done and what so the lifestyle of the patient is. For instance, if he is grossly overweight and smoking and doesn't take his blood pressure pills. Mm. Mustn't blame the doctor if he mm. gets complications. Mm. Mm. But yeah, but but is it not a situation there where you take your your your, your patient as you see him, uh, in a sense? So so what I mean by that quite simply is, is you know we have a we have a similar. Uh, theorem in law, which is we take you take your victim as you see it, you know, That's in the murder right. case, for example. But That's you right. take your, your patient as you see it. You see an obese man with an unhealthy lifestyle walking into your into your consultation rooms. You choose to treat him. Do you not then accept the responsibility? And if you then uh, are negligent or do something which is ultimately seems to be negligent by virtue of his condition, you cannot then rely on that as justification. Not necessarily, uh, but uh, we do know, for instance, obese patients have got more complications beyond the control of the doctor. Mm. For instance, sepsis of wounds, right. abnormal uh, blood sugar metabolism at the times of stress, like an operation. And then it's not really the doctor's fault, even if he has done everything to stall these complications uh, that he must be out liable for it either. Reasonable for, reasonably yeah. foreseeable or not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, once we have a duty to care, um, it should be advisable for the doctor to warn the patient of all significant risks. And then that is a condition where you can, in a spot of your informed consent, tell the patient, listen, you, have, you are unfortunately severely obese. You people will have a high incidence, for instance, for thrombosis after an operation, wound sepsis, and you are diabetic. During diabetes, you will have abnormal blood sugar metabolism that can affect your state of consciousness. Usually we will say, I will get a colleague, a physician to help me look at your diabetes. But it, when things then go wrong, as it was part of the informed consent, right. and it should have been risk that you should have known of, then the doctor can be exonerated if complications occur in that field. Okay, so well, th th that's that's good to hear because you see, I was getting I was getting to that point of you've done everything possible, you've warned the patient, you've put in those precautions, you've you've then still received the consent from the patient, and now both parties are willing to continue. Uh, yeah. That agreement or that contract that takes place, uh, you know, r limits liability on both parts. That's right. Yeah, on both parties. Well, they are human. Even though there are doctors, uh, there is an emotional, there is a sensitive element to it, uh, and it is something that we must consider very lightly, however, uh, very strongly rather, and uh, however, it is possible for doctors to have medical negligence claims against them, it is possible for them to make mistakes. As our good doctor guest, Dr. Shah, says, to err is only human, unfortunately, and as I mentioned, they are humans, and they will eventually one day make a mistake. However, it does not preclude any victim or any patient or any client from pursuing a claim against a doctor just by, maybe by virtue of the fact that they are human. Um, I think the, the, the moral of tonight's tale really is uh, conduct yourselves with ethics, conduct yourselves with morals, don't forget your religious and moral obligations. Um, and if you still feel that you have been hard done by and you believe that compensation is necessary, then by all means consult a medical negligence specialist. The doctor's details are on the screen as we speak.
excuse me, uh, and he will be able to assist you as well. Should you need to email him or call him, he will probably refer you to an attorney who he works with very closely. And if you believe that you have a, a, a good claim or are not certain as to whether you have a good claim, run it by the good doctor stroke lawyer, and he will be able to assist you hopefully and advise you as to whether you have a good claim. That's all for tonight, Dr. Shah. Mm. Thank you very, very much for assisting us. I think you've shed yeah. some um, big hospital bed-sized lights on a very controversial <laughs> issue. Um, and thank you very much, all of you, for joining us. Jazakumullah khairun for staying with us for tonight on Legal Ease. We'll see you all again next week, Thursday, on 8.30 on your educational channel, Channel 347 ITV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.